recognized by the USF Latin Community Advisory Committee with the 2016 Pathways Award for, for her work. Um, and then, you know, I don't know if these were natural skills or maybe she kind of honed them while at the University of Idaho, but she recently gave a guest lecture this past semester um, for a course, a graduate level course at USF St. Pete. And um, I was part of that course and I asked her to give a guest lecture on climate change. And it was absolutely outstanding. I would say one of the best lectures I've ever seen. Um, I personally walked away from that reevaluating some of the ways I do my lectures. <laughs> All the laughter is from people who take my class. <laughs> um, so this was on a Monday, and then on Wednesday we came in to, to do a paper discussion. And this, before we got into the discussion, the students wanted to stop and recognize how amazing they thought the lecture was, how much they enjoyed it, and how much they learned. And, and I thought that was really, really nice to have that, that level of feedback. And, um, and then, again, this is kind of her bigger vision thing. Um, she told me that she wanted to do her dance, her dissertation, <laughs> dance her dissertation. I said, well, that sounds a little new agey, and I don't you know. <laughs> <laughs> but then we watched it, and can we, at some point, <coughs> circulate the URL? Oh, sure. <laughs> um, it's, it was incredibly, not only entertaining to watch, but she really boiled down the complexities of ocean acidification and its effects on calcareous organisms and how that might influence predator-prey interactions, which is what she'll talk about momentarily, into a short video that was entertaining. And I think, you know, people from a second grader to a 90-year-old could, could grasp that and, and, and enjoy watching it and come away having learned something. So really, really another excellent way of communicating. So when, when I typically do these, I, I reach out to the lab and I reach out to <laughs> friends in the college and, and past uh, members of the college and I say, hey, I, I'd like some funny stories, some maybe mildly embarrassing photos. <laughs> um, and, and maybe I have a few here. <laughs> but what really struck me were the messages that were sent and how consistent they were. Number one, multiple people said she likes to make funny faces. <laughs> I think a lot of us probably like to make funny faces or do whether we want to or not. But the fact that er multiple people were saying that's her thing. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that kept coming up every single time was that she is an amazing friend uh, and that she's, um, she's somebody that um, you can tell there was a lot of, of, of love and respect for, for her. Um, and then again, that she loves animals, especially her dogs. Uh, recall the, the first slide. Um, but then, bigger than that, she's a trapezist, she's a belly dancer. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, look, look at this. This is, this is, this is, this is her. Do <laughs> you recognize who that is? It's Amanda. Yes, Amanda. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I could keep going on and on, but this is her hour, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end it here. Um, and, but the one thing that I want to close out with is that uh, what I think is, is really notable is how multidimensional she is, um, both from her professional uh, life as well as her personal life. And so I think we can just wrap it all up with... Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. I hope my presentation can live up to that introduction. <laughs> um, I'm actually really excited to be up here telling you about the work that I've been doing for the past six years, um, which has been taking an interdisciplinary approach to climate change research, integrating the fields of systems engineering, marine ecology, and science education. Climate change is a complex, large-scale issue with many consequences for both natural and human communities. The concentration of carbon dioxide, or PCO2, denoted here in the y-axis, on the x-axis we have the years, continues to rise at an unprecedented rate. To give you an idea of how quickly this is changing, I started my PhD 
in 2012, when the average concentration of CO2 was 393 parts per million, or ppm. In 2015, halfway through my PhD process, journey, <laughs> it was the first year in hundreds of thousands of years that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere has reached or has been an average of 400 ppm. And now that I'm finishing up my degree in 2018, the concentration of CO2 reached 410 ppm. That is almost a 20 ppm change in just six years, which is very, very rapid. As this PCO2 continues to rise, we expect that global average temperatures are also going to continue to rise. For marine environments, this is a twofold problem. Not only do we expect sea surface temperatures to rise together with global average temperatures, but also when CO2 gets absorbed by the water, by the oceans, it reacts with water, making it more acidic. So there is a relationship between CO2, which is denoted here on the y-axis to your right, and pH, which is denoted on the y-axis to your left. And on the, y, on, on the x-axis, we have years. So as the CO2 continues to rise, we expect the pH of the oceans to decrease. This ocean acidification can make environments corrosive and stressful for many marine organisms including economically important species that human communities depend on for their livelihoods. However, based on information from the Yale Program on Climate Change Communication, specifically their climate opinion maps of 2016, we know that close to 70% of adults in the US think global warming is happening. However, a smaller number, 56% of adults in the US, are worried about global warming. And an even smaller number, 38%, think global warming will harm, will harm them personally. So there's a disconnect between understanding that anthropogenic climate change or global warming is happening and accepting or, or, or people's perceived level of risk towards climate change. So to address this issue, it has been recommended to focus on children education as, as one of the options. And this is for two main reasons. One, children are the next generation of problem solvers, right? They're inheriting the earth that we are taking such good care of. <laughs> and two is the idea of a intergenerational knowledge exchange, which basically means that in the same way that children learn from adults, right? Kids learn from you, from their parents. Parents or adults can also learn from their children. So there's this idea that it's an, it's an indirect way to educate all people by educating students and children. But through um, climate change education, we need to move away from this uh, knowledge deficit model, which assumes that people don't care about something because they don't know about it. We know that Almost 70% of Americans think global warming is happening, so that's not quite it. There's that disconnect between what it means for them personally. So we need to focus more on local examples of climate change and um, ways or actions to mitigate that climate change. So since climate change is a complex problem with many ramifications, I decided to take an interdisciplinary approach to climate change research borrowing from the fields of systems engineering, analyzing experimental data, and using tools from the environmental education field. Therefore, I organized my dissertation into three main goals. One was to develop designs for climate change experimental systems that are accurate and ecologically relevant. Two was to test the effects of climate change on predator-prey relationships through laboratory experiments. And three was to assess the efficacy of an interdisciplinary climate change education program. I'd like us to focus on the first two goals of the dissertation for now. But first, I'd like you guys to partake in a little activity. So bear with me for a second. <laughs> 
I'd like you all to close your eyes. Go ahead, trust me. Even those that are, even those that are live streaming, I want you to close your eyes. So I want you to imagine that you are a marine mussel and you're living in your environment, it's comfortable, you're doing well. It starts to get warm, very warm, and it doesn't cool down as much as it used to before. So it just gets getting warmer and warmer. It becomes very stressful for you. Not only that, but you also sense something else in the water, something dangerous that also is very stressful. Go ahead and open your eyes. This is what's around you, right? So muscles don't have eyes, right? You were able to open your eyes and see what was going on, but muscles aren't able to do that. So instead, what they can do is detect chemical cues from their predators in the water. <coughs> and when exposed to these cues for very prolonged periods of time, muscles can then develop larger and thicker shells to protect themselves against this threat of predation a response we call inducible defenses. And I will continue to talk about this throughout the, throughout the talk. So let's say we have a muscle and we do a transverse cut of that muscle. So we can see what's going on in terms of shell size and thickness from this perspective. So if we take that theoretical muscle based on the information that we know from inducible defenses, they should be able to, with time, grow larger and thicker shells in a response to the presence of a predator. However, there's also evidence that elevated temperatures can limit the scope for growth of muscles. So if we take, if we go back to that theoretical muscle, the effect of elevated temperatures would be almost opposite to the effect that the presence of a predator would have. So then that bears the question, if we put muscles in a tank and expose them to stressful abiotic conditions, in this case in the form of elevated temperatures, while at the same time exposing them to stressful biotic conditions, such as predator cues, how are muscles going to respond to those simultaneous stressors? And that led me to my first of three research questions, which was, do elevated water temperatures and the presence of a predator have synergistic effects on muscle growth or affect predation susceptibility? To answer this question, I first had to build a system that I could do these experiments on. So I built a temperature controlled system, which was a flow through system. And I'll walk you through this a little bit. So water was sourced from a temperature controlled sump from there, it moved onto a primary tank, which is where I housed the crabs in my experiments. From that primary tank, water flowed onto a secondary tank, which is where I housed the mussels in my experiments. And this primary secondary tank system was to allow for chemical cues in the water for, to flow from the predators to the prey without allowing direct interactions between these two. Water then overflowed from the secondary tank onto a water bath, a, a temperature controlled water bath. This is what the system looked like in real life, not as glamorous. Um, here you can see the three mesocosms in the system. And the, um, the interesting thing is that by having a temperature controlled water bath as an indirect way to control temperature in my experimental tanks, the large temperature fluctuations that I would see in the water bath were buffered in the experimental tanks. So this allowed me to have precise and, and accurate temperature control with minimal fluctuations. And I was able to set target temperatures as close as 1.2 degrees C apart, which is very um, precise for this type of system. So now that I had a working system, I went out and collected southern rib mussels from Tampa Bay and predatory blue crabs. Very intimidating. If you're a mussel, it would be. And then I reared these mussels um, in different experimental conditions. This was a fully orthogonal experimental design where I reared muscles in the presence and absence of a predator 
as well as at low or the current temperature at the time, mid and high temperatures. These temperatures corresponded to, like I said before, the, the current temperatures at the time this experiment was done, and the temperatures expected for the year 2050 and 2100. I measured muscle morphometrics at the beginning and end of the four-week experimental period. I mes measured shell length, shell width, and whole muscle wet weight. And uh, my results showed that in terms of shell length, temperature did not affect um, the muscle scope, sp scope for growth in this morphometric. However, in terms of shell width, muscles reared in the high temperature treatment grew significantly less than those reared at the low and mid temperatures. When we take this information together with the shell length information, this meant that muscles were growing in length, but not as much in width, which caused a more elongated shell shape. In terms of whole muscle wet weight, muscles reared at the low temperature treatment grew significantly more than those at the mid and high treatments. When we look at pairwise comparison, looking at the effect of predator, I found that at the low temperature treatment, muscles that were reared in the presence of a predator grew significantly more than those reared in the absence of a predator, which is what we expected based on the information that we have from inducible defenses. What's interesting is that this effect was not seen at the mid and high temperature treatments, which means that temperature was uh, intercepting or interrupting the inducible defenses of muscles. But what consequences did these effects on morphology have on muscle susceptibility to predation? Well, to answer that question, I followed the growth experiment with handling time experiments, where I provided blue, uh, predatory blue crabs with muscles from the predator absent and predator present treatment at each of the three temperature treatments. I allowed crabs to feed uninterrupted for one hour and determine handling time from the video analysis, from the time the crab first takes hold of the muscle all the way while it's removing all that soft tissue to the point where it abandons the empty shell. Muscle handling times were dependent on crab size. So the results were analyzed using an analysis of covariance. What you're seeing here are the residuals for handling times after uh, we've accounted for the effect of crab size. And what I found was that at the low temperature treatment, muscles reared in the presence of a predator took significantly longer to get eaten than those reared in the absence of a predator. And this is the same pattern that we saw for um, whole muscle wet weight growth. So there's, there's that signal there, there's that, that predator signal that it's getting lost at the mid and high temperature treatments. <clears throat> so in summary for this first research question, I was able to develop a temperature controlled system that was highly accurate, able to maintain temperatures set up to 1.2 degrees C apart. I found evidence that southern rib muscles survived chronic thermal stress while manifesting more elongated shell shapes. And I was able to observe that the predator effect on inducible defenses was disrupted by thermal stress over 30 degrees C, followed by a decrease in predator handling times. Going back to my dissertation goals, but still um, focusing on those first two goals, let's think back to that theoretical muscle. So based on the information that we know on inducible defenses, in the presence of a predator, with time, these muscles should be able to develop <coughs> larger, thicker shells to protect themselves against the threat of predation. However, there's also evidence that elevated CO2 can also limit the scope for growth for muscles, similarly to the effect of temperature. So if we take that theoretical muscle, the effect of elevated PCO2 should be similar to that of temperature. 
So if we put mussels in to a tank and we expose them to stressful abiotic conditions in the form of elevated PCO2 and stressful biotic conditions in the form of predator cues, how are mussels going to respond to these simultaneous stressors? This led me to my second research question, which was do elevated PCO2 levels and the presence of a predator have synergistic effects on muscle growth or affect predation susceptibility? To answer this question, I developed a PCO2 system with the help of Dr. Chris Langdon at the University of Miami Rasmus. And it's a similar design in which water flowed from a sump. In this case, instead of being a temperature controlled sump, the sump was bubbled with a, ma a gas mixture uh, dependent on the target PCO2 that I wanted to reach in my experimental tanks. Water flowed from the sump onto a primary tank, which is where I housed the crabs in my experiment. From the primary tank, water flowed onto a secondary tank which is where I housed the mussels in my experiment. And again, this primary secondary tank system was to allow for the movement of chemical cues without allowing for direct interactions between predator and prey. From the secondary tank, water overflowed onto a water bath to keep temperatures homogeneous across tanks. This is what the system looked like in real life. I was very happy. Um, back here, we can see the gas cylinders that supplied CO2 and ambient air into the sumps, as well as the tool that I used to monitor PCO2 in the experimental tanks. Here we have PCO2 on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, we have time in hours. And in ambient conditions, PCO2 fluctuated naturally throughout the day mainly driven by the respiration of the organisms in the tanks. For elevated PCO2 conditions, instead of controlling the concentration of PCO2 to a specific target, like I did for the temperature controlled system, instead I increased the PCO2 by a constant factor, which allowed me to increase the average PCO2, which is denoted by the thick black line, while still allowing for those natural daily fluctuations that we saw in ambient conditions. So now that I had a working system, I went forward with my growth experiment. This was similar to the temperature experiment in that it was a fully orthogonal experimental design. Muscles were reared in the absence and presence of a predator and at ambient or current at the time PCO2 level and elevated PCO2. These PCO2 levels corresponded to, like I mentioned, the current PCO2 at the time this experiment took place, and what we expect for the year 2100. Muscles were removed from their holding tanks once a week for the four-week experimental period to measure um, muscle morphometrics, which in this case were shell length, shell width, shell depth, and wet weight and buoyant weight, which is just weight in water. These last two were used to calculate soft tissue and shell weight through time. For our results, uh, I found that muscles reared in the presence of a predator grew significantly more in terms of shell length and shell width than muscles reared in the absence of a predator. This is what we expected based on what we know from inducible defenses. However, in this case, PCO2 did not disrupt the predator effect that we see here. In terms of growth in shell depth, unexpectedly, muscles reared in the high and the elevated PCO2 conditions grew significantly more than at the ambient PCO2 conditions. So muscles reared in the presence of a predator under elevated PCO2 conditions were the only group to experience significantly higher growth in all three of these morphometrics in shell length, shell width, and shell depth, which meant they were growing uh, more rounder, more globular shapes. We did not, however, see an effect of predator or PCO2 in terms of growth in soft tissue and shell weight. 
But what consequences did, consequences did these effects have uh, on muscle susceptibility to predation? Well, I followed the growth experiments with handling time experiments, similar to uh, those for the temperature research question, in which crabs were allowed to feed on mussels uh, reared in the absence and presence of a predator at both PCO2 treatments. I saw that there were no differences in average handling times across predator or PCO2 conditions. However, muscles reared in the presence of a predator under elevated PCO2 had significantly more variable handling times. And if you recall, this is the same group that was the only group to grow in all three morphometrics, creating those rounder shells. So there is possible, there is uh, some sort of effect that these experiments were just not able to quite get to. So in summary, for the second research question, um, I was able to design a PCO2 system that was successful at maintaining target conditions while allowing for natural daily fluctuations. I found that elevated PCO2 did not interfere with inducible defenses. Muscles grew more in shell length and width as a response to predator cues. <coughs> And I also saw that muscles reared in the presence of a predator under elevated PCO2 developed rounder shapes and had highly variable handling times. So going back to my <coughs> dissertation goals, um, I'd like to move away from the first two goals and focus on the third goal of my dissertation which was to assess the efficacy of an interdisciplinary climate change education program. Like Chris mentioned before, um, close to or more than two years ago now, I was accepted as a climate communication fellow with the University of Idaho, specifically working at the McCall Outdoor Science School, or MOSS. So I'm not talking about the plant when I'm saying MOSS, I'm just talking about the school. <laughs> This took place in McCall, Idaho, which is a small town in the heart of the mountains of Idaho. It is a very different place than Florida. <laughs> I purchased my first pair of snow pants, which allowed me to be prepared for these situations <laughs> so I could lead students in the Moss Outdoor Education Program. This program provided experiential and active learning opportunities for both graduate students as well as K-12 students, <coughs> allowing them to learn by doing. During my time here, learning to put education theory into practice, I wondered if these educational approaches could be effective for climate change education. So this led me to my third and last research question, which was, can an interdisciplinary instructional program be an effective climate change educational approach? To answer this question, I developed a curriculum that looked at, that approached climate change as a socio-scientific issue, meaning that it had both repercussions for our environment and our society. I also created an activity guide to go along with the curriculum. I will say I did not develop any of these activities. My idea was not to reinvent the wheel. There are already so many tried and, and tested excellent activities out there. My idea was to compile these activities into, into, in one place with focused goals for climate change education. The learning activities included in the activity guide focused on local examples, which in Idaho are things like salmon, which have ecological, economical, and traditional importance for many human communities, as well as agriculture crops, which have significant economic importance in the state. This was a week-long week-long program, meaning Monday through Friday. Students arrived on Monday and completed their pre-assessments of the program that evening, 
During Tuesday and Wednesday, they were mostly, students were mostly in the field. These were the content heavy days. On Thursday, uh, students identified or developed an inquiry project where they identified a research question based on what they had learned the previous days and then search for an answer for that question through the scientific process. Students also uh, completed their post assessment of the program during Thursday evening. And on Friday, they presented on their projects to a group of other students, parents, and Moss staff. The curriculum content and activities were experiential and very student centered. I had a total of 22 students participate in the program divided into three field groups with seven to eight students per field group. It seemed like students were learning a lot while enjoying themselves. And when asked why CO2 in the water is important, they answered, I was very proud of that moment. <laughs> and this and the video that he's referring to was the video Chris mentioned during the introduction, the Dance Your PhD video. This is the same tool that I used with, um, with these students. So these are great anecdotal observations. But what does the data say? Well, the program was assessed by using two assessment tools. Concept maps were used to identify whether the language students used to describe climate change changed before and after the program. <coughs> These were analyzed quantitatively by using a canonical analysis of principal coordinates analysis, which is a novel multivariate approach to this sort of data. A four-question questionnaire was used to determine whether students increased content knowledge, and it was analyzed quantitatively by t-tests -test, of rubric scores and qual qualitatively to identify patterns in students' responses that may have gone unnoticed through quantitative analysis. So for now, I'd like to focus on the concept maps. This is a sample concept map from one of the students, just to give you an idea of what the students were doing. They were asked to create these kind of web diagrams based on the phrase climate change. And so I took all of these concepts and language, uh, these words that students were using to describe climate change and the, the, the ramifications of the issue, and put it into an economical canonical analysis of principal coordinates. I'll walk you through this a little bit. On the y-axis here, we have a jittered axis. That just means that the data was squished all together and you couldn't see it. So what this is doing is spreading that out so we can visualize it. But the spread of the data along this axis doesn't really bear anything to the results of the model. The placement of each data point along the x-axis is based on the words student used at that time, so pre and post the program. The tighter the points are to each other, the more similar they, their answers to the concept maps were. And I saw that there was a very clear distinction between answers in, during the pre-concept maps and post-concept maps, with the model explaining close to 70% of the variance. These differences were led mostly uh, during the pre-assessment by words that were more associated with the consequences of climate change, such as temperature and warmth. However, during the post-assessment, students used words that were not only linked to the consequences of climate change, but also to the, cons to the causes of anthropogenic climate change. 
such as fossil fuels, co carbon, coal, and oil. Students also used, um, interestingly, the word blanket, which is an, an, an analogy that we use to describe the greenhouse effect of the Earth. So moving away from the concept maps and now looking at the questionnaires for the, for the quantitative analysis, questionnaire answers showed improvement in concept knowledge. So for all four of the questions asked, which were describe climate change in your own words, how does climate change affect animals? Give specific examples. How does climate change affect people? Give specific examples. And what can you do to help, the reduce, to help reduce the impacts of climate change? For all four of these questions, test scores after the program were significantly higher than test scores before the program. Now moving into the qualitative analysis of the questionnaire answers. These, I'm going to show you a couple of examples. These are just examples. There were more of these. But just to give you an idea of, of what I saw in these, uh, in these answers. I observed that students shifted from using distant to local examples. So when students were asked, how does climate change affect animals? One student before the program wrote, climate change could melt the cold climate they live in. The melting of ice could cause penguins to lose their homes. Glaciers melting could affect wildlife. As far as I know, there are no penguins in Idaho. <laughs> so this is a more distant example of climate change. Probably what they've been experiencing through the media and different types of, of um, communication mediums. <coughs> The same student after the program wrote, climate change can destroy their habitat. Like for salmon, water is getting warmer, so they can't migrate. It could cause overcrowding of one habitat due to animals having to move. So not only is there an understanding of the consequences of climate change for specific species, but there's also an underlying understanding of the ecological processes that are going on in the background that can be disrupted by climate change. I also saw that students corrected misconceptions, common climate change misconceptions. When asked how does climate change affect people, one student wrote, climate change affects people by giving them seasons. We always have to dress appropriately. Also, some climates are getting warmer with global warming. So there is a, a misconception uh, that seasons are the same as weather, are the same as climate, and they're all the same thing. The same student after the program wrote, climate change affects people a lot. People continue to add more and more CO2 to the atmosphere, which makes it hotter. This could mean acidic water, hotter temperatures, and maybe less crops or food from animals. So not only was there an understanding of the underlying causes of anthropogenic climate change, but also a connection to their local human communities and what that means for people that live with them and around them. I also saw that students developed more focused ideas of change through the program. When asked what can you do to mitigate the effects of climate change, one student before the program wrote, not pollute a lot of bad things into the environment, and promptly dispose of dangerous waste. Although these are environmentally friendly practices, they're not directly linked to anthropogenic climate change. After the program, the same student wrote, don't use as much fossil fuel related things. When people mine gas, oil, etc., it releases CO2 into the air, which is one of the leading factors in climate change. So there is a deep understanding of the causes of climate change and what actions would, all, would actually um, mitigate climate change. So in summary for this last research question, I saw that students exhibited a deeper understanding of climate change through the words they used to describe it as evidenced by the analysis of the concept map. I saw that students increased their content knowledge on climate change causes and consequences, evidenced by the quantitative analysis of the questionnaires. 
And I also observed that students corrected common climate change misconceptions as evidenced by the qualitative analysis of the questionnaire answers. So overall, I was able to attain my three dissertation goals. I designed and built two climate change experimental systems, a temperature and a PCO2 system, which allowed me to develop cost-effective and accessible versions of these systems that um, graduate students and small research groups could um, recreate. I gathered data on the effects of climate change on predator-prey relationships through laboratory experiments, which provided evidence that muscles and ducible defenses were disrupted by high temperatures, but interestingly resilient to PCO2. And I created and assessed an interdisciplinary climate change education program that resulted in an effective and versatile curriculum for outdoor schools and environmental education programs. I've already put this program into practice at, for education and outreach um, projects that we do here at CMS, as well as the graduate class that Chris had mentioned before. And I'm also planning on providing this curriculum to uh, the outdoor school, the Moss Outdoor School, so they can also um, offer it as part of what they usually offer for their programs. Climate change is a complex and large-scale issue that can have consequences for ecosystems and society. This dissertation is an example of how taking an interdisciplinary <coughs> approach can be a comprehensive way to research complex problems. Science doesn't happen in a silo. The questions we seek to answer through research are very much affected by our social context. And there's one issue that will define the countries of this century more dramatically than any other, and that is the urgent threat of a changing climate. With that, I'd like to thank my committee members, um, all the amazing people that worked to help me here administratively, in the field, with uh, the technical parts of my dissertation, um, as well as my funding sources, the College of Marine Science, the National Science Foundation, the Sloan Foundation, and as well as my colleagues at the University of Idaho and at the McCall Outdoor Science School. I'd also like to give a very special shout out to the members of the Ghostwriter Group, which <laughs> have been there through the thick and thin of the PhD journey. I'd also like to give a special shout out to my wonderfully supportive dance community from here, from St. Pete. Some of them are here. I'm so excited that they're here. Um, and of course, I have to acknowledge my partner in life for being there every step of the way. <laughs> and as Chris mentioned, <laughs> I love making funny faces, so with a couple of pictures on the funny side of my PhD experience, I'll take questions.